Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him blows in the face. And Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus therefore came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. A very special greeting to all of you. I'm Reverend Carl Wesley Anderson. I'm an evangelist with Born to Blaze Ministries. And you know what? I get to travel the world telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is good news. But right now, there's a global pandemic. And I'm coming to you live in April of 2020, the time of Passover, the time of Easter. And we're basically here in Minnesota uh, quarantined. We're basically having a stay at home order right now from the pandemic. And there's a lot of fear and anxiety and uncertainty that's swirling around this place. So I wanna bring a message that will both inspire and challenge you to behold the man, to behold the man Christ Jesus. You know, who is Christ Jesus? And why do we celebrate Good Friday and Easter Sunday? What is it all about? Well, in this message, I'm going to talk a little bit more about who this man is, Jesus Christ. Some of his titles, for example, he's known as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he sure doesn't look like it. Look at this picture of the man. Behold the man that Pontius Pilate brings out to those crowds shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Behold this man, he's got a crown of thorns biting into his skull. There's blood dripping down his face and off the wounds from his scourging and his back and all over his body, he's exhausted and he's experiencing excruciating pain. How could this be the King of Kings? the Lord of Lords, as Isaiah calls him, the servant of the Lord. Why was this Jesus crucified like this? Why was he in a few moments from this time of Pilate raised up upon a cross with his hands and his feet pierced and that blood dripping off that old rugged tree? Why was Jesus crucified? Well, to understand this, we have to go all the way back because we serve an amazing God. In the beginning, God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, created the heavens and the earth, and all was created good. And man and woman was not only created good, but we as people were created in his image. He made us as close to anything as he could make, as close to himself. And you say, what happened? Well, there was evil present. In the garden. Now, I just said to you, God created all things good. So he's not the author of evil, but he gave his creation, especially man and woman, angels, free will. And they fell into sin. They fell in disobedience to his simple commands. And so from that, we call it the fall, arose this incredible entrance of sin and death into God's good and holy creation. So that's where we are today. We serve a God who isn't talked about very much anymore in this way, but he is essentially holy in his nature. Now that holiness from scripture derives its term, it basically means separation. So God is, first of all, is separate in himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They form a perfect love community. They created you and I to be objects of that love. But because of our sin and disobedience, because you and I, as Romans 5 declares, are part of Adam's original race, that is the rebel race, the, the race that rebelled against God in the garden, you and I were in Adam when Adam fell. So when Adam and Eve fell, you and I fell along with him and all the human race has thus fallen. And so we have the, the, the Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's holy, he's separate unto himself, but he's also separate from all evil. That is, evil and rebellion 
is that which is resisting him. So the Father, the Son, the Spirit, they separate themselves in holiness from all that is rebelling and resisting them. So what is the answer to this rebellion for mankind? What is the answer for you and I if, if we are being resisted by a holy God who not only is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. Out of his love flows mercy. Out of his justice flows wrath and judgment. And these are integral parts of who the Lord is. In fact, the Lord announced to Moses when Moses was hiding in the cleft of the rock in Exodus 33, the Lord announces his name. He announces his character. He declares this, I am the Lord. I am loving, kind, and tender mercy. I am a God of love. But he also says in the next verse, I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, but I will visit their iniquity upon the third and fourth generations. You say, who are the guilty? You say, I, I'm a pretty good person, right, Carl? Come on, I'm a good person, right? Well, just being morally good will not save you from the coming judgment. There is a judgment day that's coming at the end of all recorded history. It's still yet to come. And on that judgment day, you will be judged, not according to your morality, but you will be judged because you are an enemy of God, a rebel of God, one disobedient to God, and one who is spiritually separated from him from birth. That's what Ephesians 2 tells us. We as Gentiles, we as anybody born, are born separate from this holy God. So there's no hope for us in this world. There's no hope for you. If you're watching this and you've never made a commitment to this man, behold the man, this bloodied man upon the cross, well, there's no hope for you in the sense that you cannot, by your own works, attain salvation. So into all of this, this holy God steps into this world, which, by the way, was created as a sanctuary, and the moment sin entered, it became a prison. That's right. This world is a prison cell. And so somebody from outside the sphere of sin and death and curses and our enemy Satan somebody greater than the powers that be in this earthly realm right now had to invade this earth, had to come in as the divine one, as the divine king, somebody holy but loving had to enter in and invade the realm of darkness and usher in light, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Just as a side note, can you believe it? Here in Minnesota, it's spring, it's Easter time, and it snowed this morning. I was in prayer, look out the window, it was snowing, I was so shocked. I grabbed my camera and I had to film it. And you know that snow this morning reminded me so beautifully of Isaiah chapter one, the prophet of God, God's voice to you saying, behold, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. That's the Lamb of God. If I could, I'd like to read for you just a little portion of scripture from Isaiah chapter 53, talking about this Lamb of God. Here's what was prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before the Lamb of God was slain upon that cross and his blood dripped down that tree. Here's what Isaiah said. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs and sins he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Now, I love the analogy that John gives us of Christ. He's the only gospel writer that tells us this. Early in John's gospel, chapter 1, John the Baptist is preaching, and he sees Jesus, and he says these words, Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Two 
exciting characteristics of a lamb I want to bring before you. And they are the lamb throughout history that God set up through the people of Israel, through the people that had faith, through the, being the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those one people of God in the earth, God established blood sacrifices. He said this, I will look upon the blood and I will pass over the sins of the people. Why? Because only by the shedding of blood is forgiveness of sin secured. So they would slay a lamb every year and that lamb would be a sin offering unto the Lord and the sin offering would then pass over the sins of those people and cause them to be looked upon as righteous in God's eyes. Number two, the Lamb of God represents the Paschal Lamb or the Passover Lamb. In fact, Passover was instituted at the time of the Exodus when God's people were put a, a blood cross upon their doorpost and when the, when the angel of death passed over, when he saw the blood, they were delivered. So the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb that's being celebrated, in fact, the same night as I record this recording for all the Jewish people. If you're Jewish and you're watching this, let me tell you about the true Paschal Lamb. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the same one that Pilate presented and said, behold the man. That is the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. He takes away my sin. If you look upon him with faith today, if you look upon the God of love upon the cross, the God whose arms are stretched out, the God who is full of love for those that are opposing him, the God who bears the punishment for sin upon his own back, and he, he becomes crucified. He becomes killed for you and I. He takes your place. He's also pictured as the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. Incredible picture. Jesus Christ, he's, he's the roaring lion of Judah, but he's also the Lamb of God who bore the sin of the world. And because he died on the cross, he didn't stay dead, by the way. He was hung up on that cross and he died. He called out, it is finished. And what was finished? It was the invading warrior king taking Satan by the throat and defeating the power of sin, sickness, death, and the enemy by dying. By dying and taking upon the sin of the world, he paid the price for sin and he defeated death forever. And three days later, we, we celebrate on Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead. He came out of that tomb. He came through his grave clothes and out the tomb and appeared to as upwards of 500. He ascended into heaven as the eternal King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you look upon him with faith today, you too can be saved from your sin. Oh, my brothers and my sisters and those who love the Lord, I say to you, on this Good Friday, on this season of Easter, behold the Lamb. Behold the man, but behold the Lamb. To those of you watching who are maybe outside of Jesus Christ, I encourage you now, would you pray with me? Today is the day of your salvation. If you can look upon this Lamb by faith, and receive his sacrifice for your sin and his taking your punishment upon his back, which you were due. Because while you were yet a sinner, Christ appeared and died for you. That's the good news. He's no longer a God of wrath at the moment. He's holding back his wrath until the end of days when he will come again to judge the living and the dead. But until then, the door of mercy is open for you. The door of mercy is open for you right now. If I can, I'd like to lead us all in a word of prayer. Whether you know the Lamb or whether you're just getting to know Him, I dare you, would you pray with me now? Repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I come before the Lamb of God and I surrender my life afresh to you. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I receive your forgiveness today. I receive the covering of your blood today. I receive forgiveness of sin and I repent, Father, in the name of Jesus. And I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin and unrighteousness and receive me now as a child of God. 
In Jesus' name, amen. This is my servant who will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Behold the man. Thank you.